This morning, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael McCracken. Dr. McCracken comes to us from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where he is Deputy Leader of the Atmospheric and Geophysical Sciences Division. Uh, Dr. McCracken did his undergraduate work at Princeton, received his PhD from the uh, University of California, Davis, where he undertook modeling studies on various proposed causes of ice ages. At Lawrence Livermore, uh, the related work that he has done has included modeling uh, on the climatic impact assessment study. And since 1979, he has been the scientific director for um, DOE's CO2 climate research program. He also serves on the National Academy of Sciences panel on CO2-induced climate change. His topic today is climatic warming from increasing carbon dioxide concentrations. Dr. McCracken. Thank you. Late in the 19th century, it was recognized by some uh, geologists that carbon dioxide was a component of the atmosphere that could, could have possibly induced some, pos some past climatic changes. It wasn't recognized quite then that man would have an influence, but then about 50 years ago, uh, calendar suggested that man's emissions could actually be having an influence. That was dismissed, although some of you may have remembered reading when you were young, or I remember when I was young, uh, reading in Popular Science and Popular Mechanics how CO2 was warming the world and, and uh, we were going to melt ice caps and things. But the idea was basically dismissed until the 50s because there was so much carbon in the ocean that it was felt that the ocean could take up whatever man emitted. But over the last 25 years, there's been a lot of serious concern when it was recognized that that wasn't really true. And so some statements, uh, rather provocative statements, have been issued by rather prestigious bodies that try and uh, raise the fossil fuel issue. Um, and as a result of statements such as this, uh, there's been a Department of Energy research program for about the last four or five years. Um, the CO2 problem was made one of the uh, two environmental issues that was specifically mentioned in the Sinfuels bill that went through Congress, the other being acid rain. It's also raised a lot of uh, sort of popular interest, and the, the uh, next slide shows what one company's view of the CO2 issue was and about what will happen. Um, what I'm going to try and do today is cover some topics and try and put in perspective what's going to happen. Um, I want to talk um, about uh, the carbon cycle, what, what the basis is for the notion that carbon dioxide concentrations are and will be increasing. Um, I want to talk about, provide a little background information on the climate. Most people are concerned about the climatic effects of what might happen. Uh, then talk about the effects of CO2 on the climate and, and why this little bit of change in CO2 is able to have such an influence on the climate. There's been a lot of interest recently about searching for evidence that the climate is changing or has changed. Um, and I want to make some comments on that and the, the difficulty of searching for that evidence. Finally, um, maybe a few implications about what, what this all means. Well, the the fundamental hard evidence that CO2 is changing is shown on the next view graph, which is the longest continuous set of measurements that's been made. It's been made at Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. Uh, basically, what it shows is a, a seasonal cycle where the CO2 peaks in, the, in about April of a year after the, the decay of all the vegetation, and it goes to a minimum as through the growing season and so is at a minimum in about October when the decay sort of process starts over again. So you see a gradual increase in the annual average from about 315 parts per million to, it's up at 340 now about, um, with a, a seasonal cycle imposed on that. Seasonal cycle uh, is somewhat larger, somewhat north of Mauna Loa, 
it's considerably less in the southern hemisphere where there's much less biosphere um, to interact with it. Um, the average concentration in the southern hemisphere is a little bit below this, the northern hemisphere, lagging about one to two years, which is about the time that, that we know it takes for air to interchange based on radionuclide experiments. Um, just for later, well, for the next, as background for the next slide, let me d give some units. These are in parts per million of volume. Um, you can also think of them in terms of gigatons per hemisphere of carbon. Uh, I, I want to do that because that's what they talk about emissions in terms of. Gigatons is 10 to the 15th grams. It's sort of an inconceivable kind of number uh, to me. Uh, but I'll, I'll be talking about it on the next slide and some stuff on carbon cycle. What's interesting is that if you look at the seasonal change, this is about five or six parts per million, which is equivalent of five or six or seven gigatons of carbon. Okay, now, I'll come back to it, but fossil fuel emissions right now are about five gigatons of carbon. So the, the seasonal change, everything you see in the northern hemisphere that grows, basically, or that is, that is grown from, from the winter to the, through the summer, all the grass and the leaves on the trees and the, the limbs and the increased limbs, not the standing carbon, uh, but, but the, the annual growth is about equivalent right now to man's emissions within a factor of, I don't know, 25 or 50 percent or something like that. So that, that maybe gives you a feel for gigatons and the magnitude of man's impact on what's happening. The next um, slide shows the various reservoirs where carbon is, is stored. Um, in the atmosphere, there's about, between the upper and lower atmosphere right now, about 700 gigatons. Um, the living biosphere, standing living biosphere, all the forests have about the same amount. The soil has about twice that amount. Upper ocean is about the same as the atmosphere. And then the deep ocean has lots of carbon, and then there's lots in the, in the fossil fuel reserves that exist here. And you can look at some of the fluxes. These fluxes look quite large compared to fossil fuel of, here they say six, it's really, I think, been revised down to about five recently. But, but uh, these interchanges that go on between the biosphere and the atmosphere, for example, based on, say, radionuclide studies of exchange rates and things, show, show quite large numbers. But the, a lot of that is just the respiration process. And so it isn't really the net growth. So that the five or six here is about equivalent to the net growth over a season in the northern hemisphere. There's also large exchanges with the ocean. Um, in order to predict future carbon dioxide concentrations, what you want to know is how this system really works. A lot of these numbers are sort of estimates. Um, there's, so the, the information that exists are what the present concentrations have, have been. There are some indications of what past concentrations have been in the last century, when instead of 340 parts per million, it was probably around between 250 and 290. I'll come back to that. There are some recent ice core measurements shown on the next slide, which indicate what concentrations have been about during the last uh, 10,000 years. They go down in the ice cores. They, they get the air out of the bubbles that are trapped in the ice cores, and they measure the carbon dioxide concentration of it. Uh, there's some large potential errors in some of that. and You have remelting and all kinds of other things. But they're starting to work out problems. So they think that the background concentration is about 300 parts per million. Um, this is from Greenland. This is from the Antarctic here. Um, this great dip that comes in the oxygen-18 isotope curves and in the CO2 is during the last major glacial cycle. Um, so there's some thought that CO2 was actually less during the last glaciation. Whether that was a cause or a result of it is not at all clear. Um, another thing we know about the carbon cycle is sort of what's been happening recently. Um, well, in the past hundred years, you can reconstruct the emissions of carbon. Um, the next view graph isn't really emissions, but it's world energy use, which is essentially the, the same thing. Uh, I won't go through a conversion to gigatons here. But, but what you can see is th they've gone back and they've done a lot of compilations back to the middle of the last century on fossil fuel emissions. Uh, and you can see it's basically exponential except for World War I, the Depression, World War II, and then this doesn't show it, but 
but in the later 70s, it, the growth rate has changed from about 4% per year to down to about 2% per year due to the, the price increase of uh, fossil fuels. Um, another source of information um, is shown on the next slide, which is based on some isotopic ratios information that come basically, I think, from tree rings mainly, this information does. If you measure the carbon-13 in tree rings and then sort of try and extrapolate back to what the atmospheric value was, you get what the, these data points here. Um, and that is, uh, and so it's, it's um, the, the carbon-13 in the atmosphere has basically been going, going down. And the, and the question is basically why that's true. If you take the fossil fuel emissions, and, and it turns out plants differentiate in how much carbon-13 they have compared to, to, uh, to what the atmosphere has. If you do just fossil fuel emissions and project back in time, basically, from the, from the present and go, present and go back, I guess, what you find is that you don't match the curves very well. I guess I start from the reference here. I'm sorry, I come forward. You don't match the data very well. And so what they're, everybody's sort of recognized that there had to be a tremendous injection of carbon also from the biosphere, the expansion of agriculture, the industrialization of agriculture. Because you plow up, you cut down the forest, you plow the soil, you oxidize the humus. And so if you, the, the next slide sort of shows what happens when you try and put all this together in terms of what they think fossil fuel emissions are. These are basically fossil fuel emissions, this exponential curve. And then this is what must have been true in the biosphere if, this, if the total information on carbon-13 was to be true. So that there, was, there, there has been probably a major increase from about 250 parts per million early in the last century. Um, due, to, due to man's activities in the biosphere. Um, there aren't really many measurements, there aren't any measurements that go back there to, to, to say what the atmospheric concentration really w was, so this is sort of derived information. There are some measurements back in here, but most of them were made in the industrial areas of Europe and were so subject to local sources that you really, and there was so much scatter in the data, you really can't interpret them very well. <coughs> 